that. All right, here we go. We're going to Romans chapter 5. the word that's what that's about all right here we are Romans 5 I'm going to read 1 through uh, 5 and then uh, then I'll then I'll comment father would you open your word to us would you open our hearts to the word we love you and we want to hear from you we need you to build our faith we need you to teach us we need you Lord with your wonderful two-edged sword of the word to cut our hearts and and heal us and change us and transform our attitudes we come to you now and ask for you to minister life to us and I pray for grace on me so that I can speak your word and not mine come Holy Spirit and do a work in Jesus name amen, amen. all right in chapter 4 Paul has been talking about Abraham and how by faith God blessed him and gave him righteousness and then we pick up at chapter 5 verse 1 he says therefore having been justified by faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ would you say peace with God, peace with God. verse 2 through whom we also have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand and we exult in the hope of the glory of God. Would you say we stand in grace? We stand in grace. Would you say we exult in hope? We exult in hope. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations. Would you say we exult in our tribulations? We exult in our tribulations. Yeah, that one's not as much fun, is it? <laughs> Knowing that our tribulation brings about perseverance and perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Now turn to your discussion guide. Just as Abraham's faith brought him righteousness and great blessings, those who have faith in Jesus Christ also receive righteousness and great blessings. Yet as Paul reminds us in this passage, our faith doesn't always protect us from suffering. Have you noticed? In fact, sometimes we suffer because we have faith. We still live on a rebellious planet, in rebellious bodies, and during a season of time in which Satan is active. So along with blessings, Paul says we can also expect tribulations. And by that term, he certainly means the things we suffer because of our faith in Christ, religious persecution, spiritual oppression, temptation, the pain of loving and serving. How many know it hurts to love and it hurts to serve, doesn't it? Yeah. But his words here are true for all the suffering this world brings upon us. In the midst of any type of trials, Paul wants us to remember that God is able to use those trials to make our faith stronger and to draw us closer to him. This is why he says we can rejoice in or boast about, that's what the word means, that exult thing, our tribulation. Instead of destroying our faith, tribulation will only prove that our faith in God is genuine. Of course it pleases him to see our faith endure a test and he rewards us accordingly. But he already knew our faith was genuine. The person who actually discovers how real our faith in is in the middle of a trial is who? Yeah, it's us. In difficult times, we discover we really meant it when we surrendered to Jesus and took up our cross to follow him. That there is within us a true faith that nothing can shake. Somebody say amen. All right, now let's look at it verse by verse. I want you to see what Paul said, and then we'll, then we'll apply it to our lives. Verse 1, he has said, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says, believers in our Lord Jesus Christ enter into a state of peace 
with God. His point, of course, is that God is at peace with us, not that we are at peace with him. Though ending our rebellion was an essential part of our repentance. Now, we who were rebels and walked away from him need no longer fear the judgment we would have faced on judgment day, nor are we any longer kept at a distance from him because of our sins, nor do we need to be ashamed to come to him in prayer and worship, nor is he angry at us for our weaknesses and failings. Instead, he loves us and blesses us and treats us as a parent with a child, which, of course, includes parental discipline. Verse 2, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace. Because we are spiritually joined to Jesus, we now have perpetual access to God's grace. We may always turn to him for forgiveness and help, and we can confidently declare that in the future we will dwell in heaven in the glory of God. Verse 3, and not only this, but we also exult in tribulations, knowing that our tribulation brings about perseverance. Yet we still live on a rebellious planet and during a season of time in which Satan is active. So along with these blessings, we can also expect to experience tribulation. Yet God is able to make everything that happens to us work for good in our lives. Do you see that? Even hardship and persecution will refine our character, helping us to become more and more like Jesus. Knowing this changes our attitude towards such troubles. As unpleasant as some may be, they teach us to persevere. They force us to walk more deeply in faith and find spiritual disciplines that really work for us. Come on, it's in the middle of hardship when you really grow, yeah. isn't it? You know, I, you can talk to me all day about the fact that I need to pray and I ought, to, I ought to try out some fasting and some worship and Bible study. And I go, yeah, I believe that. Amen. I'm all for it. It's totally true. But when I'm in trouble is when I'll actually go, you know, maybe I ought to take a day here and spend with the Lord. It's in those moments that I begin to find the disciplines in my life that will bring me back to Jesus. Hardship, those kinds of things actually work for good in my life. Verse 4, Persever perseverance brings, and mine translates it, proven character is what mine says. So trials end up not destroying us, and the, but the word they translate proven character is actually, and you knew this, dokimazo. You would have told me the same thing. It's dokimazo. You want to try that? Dokimazo, yeah course that's the verbal form the noun is dokime here All right you know what it means to be put in a crucible and tested ground up heated up the impure tested to see whether the contents are genuine you put in a crucible so paul says paul says here he says when i have to persevere through hard times difficult things he said, it's like God puts my faith in a crucible and he proves that the faith inside of me is genuine. Isn't that powerful? Verse 4 again. And proven character, or this proving of my faith, produces hope. There is also something else that takes place when we go through trials. Our grip on this world grows weaker and weaker, while our longing for eternal life and seeing Jesus face to face grows stronger and stronger. I think it between hardship and old age, you'll find that your love of the world, your grip on this planet, lets go. You, you begin to be less and less committed to, the, to just the pleasures of this world and the things of this planet. After a while, you just don't care that much anymore. You go through some of these hard times and you come out the other side and you're glad for being out and you're glad for a healing or you're glad for a provision or whatever came. But, but the message is deeper than that. When you see God work on your behalf is you, you appreciate his love and him. Hardship in this world makes me long for heaven. 
And that's not a wrong thing. I can't abandon this planet and run. I can't hurry the process. But my heart begins to go to him. I was just in a meeting uh, with a group of, uh, of leaders, and, and somebody asked the question, what's the, what's the most difficult thing you're going through? What a question to ask. That, and it, did, it, it took the whole evening as people just bleh, you know. <laughs> What was interesting, and there was young and old, and, and what was interesting to me was three of the older people said this. I mean, the same words practically. They said, I'm, I'm having to cope with my mortality. Looking in the mirror going, who's that? realizing you're getting older, realizing that the bulk of your life is behind you and the, the part remaining is much shorter. It does something to you. You begin to realize, wow. Some people come to a place in life and they say, is this all there is? I mean, I've been pursuing this my whole life and now that I have it, do I want it? There's all kinds of adjustments that go on. God uses those kinds of hardship to cause my heart to move toward heaven. That's what Paul's calling hope. That my heart, my love is to be with him, is to see Jesus face to face. That longing grows in me. Verse 5, and hope, this hope for eternal life and being with him, does not disappoint. I will not be frustrated. My hope for eternal life will not be found to be falsely placed because God is indeed going to give me everything I hope for. Paul calls this our hope, and he says that we can be absolutely confident this hope will be fulfilled because the power of the Holy Spirit, which is a foretaste of eternity, has already been given to us. Through the Spirit dwelling in us, we feel God's uncompromised love for us, we have already begun to experience what it means to have our sins totally forgiven and live in his grace. You see that? And hope does not disappoint, Paul says, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who is given to us. That's what the passage means. I just, we've just looked at those verses. Now let's apply it to our lives. How, does God, how God uses tribulation... Paul has outlined a process that takes place inside a believer's heart when going through prolonged hardship. He says, tribulation makes us learn how to endure through difficult times when faith, our faith comes under attack. By enduring hardship, our faith is proven to be genuine and grows stronger. And when our faith grows strong, we find ourselves longing to be with Jesus faith, face to face. And the Holy Spirit who lives inside us reassures us that God loves us and will surely take us to himself when we die. So in the midst of hardship, God teaches us to see the situation from his perspective. He adjusts our thinking, our attitudes, and our goals. One of the things that happens when you go through hardship is you get humbled. <laughs> A lot of your preconceived notions, your theologies, the things that you're just so sure about get really readjusted and softened, don't they? Yeah, fa hardship. By the way, how many of you are, would say, I'm in some kind of trial, some kind of difficult thing. It's been a long time. You've been, it's physical. It's relational. It's what, you're in one right now. Hold your hand up. Okay, a lot of us. All right. They're painful. And, you know, you can, you can have your theologies about now all we're going to do is, is, is we're going to claim this and we're going to pray this and then it's all going to go away. And sometimes it does. And sometimes it doesn't. I had a phone call with a, with a, with a dear friend. I've known him for, since, since I was in, in seminary. And uh, we, we raised our families, you know, and watched our, I don't know, his children and the whole thing, and, and uh, his wife has, had become ill with a, with a form of cancer, and uh, I have been praying. He has pressed in as intensely to, to obtain her healing as 
anybody I've seen. And I've seen people do that very, very, very sincerely. And it was sincere. He just did everything he knew to do. He took her everywhere he knew to take her. Everything he knew how to do to have a healing for his wife. And just in the past uh, couple of weeks, she passed away. I've prayed for her. He's, uh, every, we have actually. He said to me, he said, I, I hope the Lord, I am so sorry, so I guess the way he said it, that I didn't have the faith to see my wife healed. Now, now where's he going with this thing? My fault. And I said, you cannot do that. I said, I don't know anybody who's pursued God any harder than you did. You cannot go there. People, listen to me. There's a mystery in this thing with hardship and with healing. There are times that you're going to see incredible, wonderful healings, and there's other times when you are not, and there's no explanation, and you get really dangerous when you try to give an explanation. I said to him, you can't go there, and, I, and then I don't know why, I just, but I felt, and I said, and you must not somehow in this blame her. Because one of the things that comes out of this, when you have this approach, you try to have a worldview that says, if we simply push that button, pull that lever, and add that substance, we are going to get our healing. And when you don't, what do you have to do? You have to figure out whose fault it is. You have to. So you begin to look around, is it my fault? Or, and this is, this is the cruelest blow of all. The poor person who, who, who got sick or died, it's their fault. Not only do you have to be miserable with the disease, but you need to now feel rotten about yourself because you're not getting healed. What's the matter with you? And so we punish you on top of the matter. And I said, you must not blame her. Not that he had. But I just know where this kind of thinking goes. It's not her fault. When you go through hardship... And when an answer doesn't come quickly, and I mean you can go through some that go days, months, years, decades. It humbles you. It busts down your little formulas. It, it busts down things. You know, it's one thing for these evangelists. I, I, have the, I have the lovely job of being a pastor. So an evangelist can roll into town with his 18-wheeler and set up his deal... And he can have these healing ministries, and it's, yeah. And then I'm the pastor who gets to be there if it comes back. And gets to be at the bedside in the hospital, or gets to be at the funeral when we bury the person. I have to believe with all my heart and the power of God. And listen, we're seeing healings all the time. They were telling me one this past week that was just like you could write it up in a book. God's doing stuff. But at the, on the same half, we're burying people. We live with this mystery. And it's humbling. And it also refines our faith. And it refocuses what's important. In the midst of hardship, God teaches us to discover spiritual disciplines that work. In the midst of hardship, God teaches us to refuse to deny him, refuse to quit, refuse to give in, to refuse to curse God and die. You're going to find that what God has begun in you, the seed he's planted in you, the faith that's in you, if you're a, uh, if you're a man or woman who's, who's been 
You've received Jesus Christ. You have surrendered your life to him. You have received him. That what has been put inside of you is far deeper and stronger and more resilient than you have any idea. You may think that, oh, it'll come and it'll destroy my faith, but instead it refines it. It, Paul says, it puts it in a crucible, heats it up, and shows it to be genuine. Things that you thought, if that ever happened, I, I don't know what I'd do. And then, lo and behold, it does happen. And you find that your faith does not shake. What Jesus does inside of us is very real. It's more real than we realize. Does, in the midst of hardship, God teaches us to discover that faith, the faith inside me is real and can't be shaken, to, to transfer the focus of my desires from his blessings here on this earth to just wanting to be close to him and to be in his glory. Hardship does that. It makes the world less sweet. It makes the, I mean, even when you finally come out the other end, you don't love it like you did. But you long for him. To stop fearing death. To let my fear of being judged by him, that is, melt in the warmth of his love, knowing that he is at peace with me. Now I know why James, in, in, the, in his letter, says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. What does it produce? Endurance. The testing of your faith produces endurance. You learn to hang on and to trust through long periods of time. Produces endurance, and let endurance, he says, have its perfect result, come to its complete result, so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. Let it refine you. Let God do in you and, and, and refine your faith in the midst of it. Now, please notice the question we are not addressing today. Why does God allow suffering? Why doesn't God stop evil acts? Why are children born with genetic defects? Why does disease kill and injure the best and the kindest people? Why does God allow his own people to be viciously martyred? If God exists and he's powerful and good, how can he sit back and watch all this and not do anything to stop it? Today, we will not be diverted into this philosophical discussion. As you might well imagine, I have already answered that, and I have a written answer for you. We're going to talk about it today, because that's not the point. Today, it's enough to recognize that Paul simply says, Tribulation will come, but it won't win. That's what he says. It is not abnormal that you have difficulties in your life. It is not abnormal that problems are, that come. You don't need to feel guilty about it. It's not your, it's not your fault. Some things can be, but you'll, we'll all know that. Let's suppose that I'm in some sort of affliction right now. What does this passage say to me? And I saw a lot of hands a minute ago. Here's what this passage says to you right now in the middle of your difficulty. Number one, it says, regardless of what's happening, God didn't send it. He's at peace with me. Say, he's at peace with me. He is not angry at you. He is not punishing you. What's the first thing that comes to mind when you suddenly have some bad diagnosis or something terrible happens? What's the first thing that tends to come to mind? Come on. What did I do wrong? Oh, God, why are you doing this to me, right? We're like children with a school teacher. It always goes back to this, what did I do? Why are you doing this? When he says he's at peace with you, the, God has no anger, no agenda. He, has, he does not send it. Regardless of what hap is happening, God didn't send it. Yes, we know he chastens us. But he doesn't have to invent, invent trouble. Our own disobedience and the devil supply more than is needed. God doesn't have to go, let's see now. Steve's had it too easy. I'm going to have to invent some problem and send it into his life. 
He doesn't do that. He lets Steve do something stupid. <laughs> I bring my own problems, thank you very much. Or, or the devil has his own stuff along the line, doesn't he? Just serving the Lord brings hardships. In the midst of trouble, it is vital to know that he is my help and not my problem. We had um, a while back a pastor by the name of Jerry Cook. I don't know if you'll remember that. Several years ago now, he spoke to us. And uh, when he came, he was very fragile. He had just gone through bowel cancer and, and, and the, the uh, chemotherapy and the, and the um, radiation and all of that. And Jerry described some of the tremendous pain and difficulty he went through, the sickness and the suffering. You know what it is? He, he described what it is to, to just try to make it through the night, you know, to just get to the, to the morning with the pain. And it was really quite, quite touching. And he said this. He said, if I had thought for a moment that in the middle of that, that God had sent it. I'd have been devastated. And he said, I knew that God had not sent the cancer. He hated it as much as I did. Now that is really important. Are you getting your mind around this? God didn't send it. Well then where? Don't go there. Stop. Yes. He didn't send it. He hates it too. Point number two. But you won't go through it alone. I won't go through this alone. Say that. He is with me. He will not leave me for a moment. Because I stand in his grace. When, you, when, you, when Paul says we stand in his grace, it means you're firmly rooted in the grace of God and you never come out of it. The grace is constantly there. In some of the darkest moments of my life, he speaks the loudest. Have you had him speak to you in some of the most painful, some of the most depressing, some of the most miserable moments of your life and had his wonderful voice break through? Some of the loudest things he said to me have been at some of the lowest points of my life. I, I, for some reason, the one, one that comes to my mind, it was very early on. Um, probably we had been married for my, n seven, eight months, I don't know, somewhere around in there. Mary and I were living in Minnesota, and I was going to a seminary, and she's working at, at a hot, near, hot, nearby hospital. And we've been over visiting her parents. Now, it had nothing to do with that, okay? <laughs> it was not her parents. But we had gone through, if I recall, it was like three weeks of what I call a, in, in Minnesota a lead sky. Here we've got clouds a lot through the winter. But there, there's a wind that blows, and it's flat. You know, there's, and, and whatever it happens, the, the clouds get, they undulate a little bit. But they're solid. It's like a lid over you. And I'd call it a, I call it a lead sky. And we hadn't seen the sun for probably three weeks at that point. That may have had something to do with all this. But we were driving home. And I don't know what happened. I couldn't tell you what it was. But I been, began to feel like if I weren't careful, my mind would leave me. I'd never had that before. I've always felt kind of in control of my, my mind. And I was, I, I just, it, it's like that, and I felt like that sky was just coming down and crushing me. And I pulled over to the side of the road, and we weren't very far from our, from our apartment. I pulled over to the side of the road and said, you, you got to drive. I can't drive anymore. And she gets, you know, she gets out, and this is on the freeway. She gets out, gets around, gets in the driver's seat, drives me home. I go in, I lie down on the bed, you know, and I'm just, I'm just, I'm terrified. 
I mean, I'm sitting and holding on to my mind. And I don't know where it's going to go if I let go. And I'm just, oh. And so my wife can be quite the Pentecostal <laughs> when she needs to be. So again, my daughter is me, I had. And, and she put her hand on me, my, she, she put her hand on my, my, right on my stomach, I'm lying on my back, on the, on the bed, and she just starts going in tongues, man. She's just praying over me like crazy. And as she's praying, suddenly the thing stopped, and the Lord spoke to me as clear as day. I mean, right to my heart, and he said, this is the bottom, it will be up from here. And I went, oh, thank heavens. I don't think I can do this again. <laughs> the fear was gone. I did not, I knew I wouldn't do that again. I didn't know what happened, and I, nor have I, by the way. I mean, I've had depression. This wasn't depression. I don't know what you'd call it. I don't know if this is what they call nervous breakdowns. I can't give you a psychological explanation. I don't, I don't know enough to, to describe what it was. But it was something like I've never had before, and I haven't had since. But he said, this is the bottom. From here it's up. In the darkest moments, have you ever been in a place where you've done something and you're so ashamed, you're so angry at yourself, you think you're just such a stupid idiot, you can't believe you're that stupid. And in that kind of depression and self-loathing, have you ever had the Holy Spirit say, I love you? I have. To the point that I've answered back and said, you can't, what's wrong? Stop it. <laughs> you know who you're talking about. Had him just pierce my heart in some of the most awful moments and say, I love you. He's at peace with me because I have faith in his son, Jesus Christ. No matter what I go through, he will never leave me or forsake me. Thirdly, this suffering will not last. Would you say this suffering will not last? This suffering will not last. At its worst, it can only kill me and send me into eternal glory. <laughs> That's the worst thing you can do to me, you know? If you kill me, I'm instantly in the presence of the Lord forever. There you go. Philippians 3, verses 10 and 11, Paul says, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. And then he says this, and you think, where did that come from? And the fellowship of his sufferings. When you know Jesus, you're going to know two things. Now, the problem is in the American theology, in the American church, we only have one side of it. He says, that I may know him, and if I do, I'll know the power of his resurrection. <laughs> Hallelujah. But we don't add very often. If we're smart. <laughs> and the fellowship of his sufferings. You want to know Jesus? You're going to know power, and you're going to know the fellowship of his sufferings. Suffering is not abnormal to us. Suffering is not a sign of failure. You follow the Lord, you will suffer. Number four, this suffering won't destroy me. It can only strengthen me. Would you say that? God has a plan for my life. He guides, sets boundaries, overrules, so that tribulations are forced to serve his plan for me. If you belong to him, he has his hand on your life, and he will cause whatever comes to work together for good in your life. One of the passages that I, I, I really love, it's, and I have it there, you don't need to turn. Certain sermons that you preach actually stick with you over time, and this is one of them. It's my sermon out of Genesis 50 with Joseph. I just love that sermon. That was so good. And, well, I'd never seen it before. The Lord's teaching me, and, and, it, and I continue to come back to it. You remember Joseph has his brothers come to him, and they think that he's going to kill them now that it, their father has died. And so they're begging for their life, and they're asking for Joseph to just enslave them because that's what they did to him. 
And he answers them several things. But the, the second thing he says to them is this. You have it there. He says, as for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result. To preserve many people alive. You tried to put me in a pit and kill me. And then you decided to sell me to a passing sl band of, of slave sellers and sell me to Egypt. And all you did was catapult me into the will of God. Listen, no man and no circumstance can overrule the plan of God for your life. You need to get a hold of that because fear comes in and we think somebody hurts me. This happens to me. This, this trouble, this pain comes into my life. And you think, see now, I've lost everything. It's impossible. God's plan for your life is God's plan for your life. Now, he can't make you participate, but as long as you stay with him, he will get you where you belong. There's a plan to him. Joseph... They tried to do all that. And, and Joseph doesn't say, oh, you guys, it was just a brotherly fight. He says, you tried to kill me. You meant evil. I know what was in your heart. I remember, I remember the moment. But you can't take God's plan. All you did is shove me into the plan God has for my life. Suffering won't destroy me. It can only strengthen me. God is greater than any man or circumstance. You cannot take my blessing or my destiny. God will overrule you. Say amen. amen. All right, let's conclude this. Let's listen to Paul boast. Now, Paul boasts in his tribulation. You want to hear him boast? Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Let's listen to Paul boast for a minute. He says we boast in our tribulations. He does it. Hear what it sounds like. Chapter 4, verse 9, 1 Corinthians. Paul says, For I think God has exhibited us apostles last of all as men condemned to death, because we have become a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are prudent in Christ. We are weak, but you're strong. You are distinguished, but we are without honor. To this present hour, we are hungry and thirsty and poorly clothed and roughly treated, and we are homeless, and we toil with working with our own hands, and when we're reviled, we bless, and when we're persecuted, we endure. When we're slandered, we try to conciliate. We have become as the scum of the world and the dregs of all things. That's boasting, man. He, I'll show you a little more. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Listen to him boast again. He's boasting in his tribulation. He's boasting in his sufferings. He says here, uh, verse 23, he says, I have been in far, more, in far more labors, in imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death. Five times I received from the Jews the 39 lashes. That's because they thought 40 would just disgrace you and make you do stuff that you shamed you. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A day and night I have spent in the deep. I've been on frequent journeys and dangers from rivers, robbers, my countrymen, Gentiles, dangers in cities, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren, people betraying him. I've been in labor and hardship through sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from that, there, there is the daily pressure of concern for all the churches. Then he says at verse 30, if I have to boast... I'll boast in what pertains to my weaknesses. And then in case you wonder, he goes on in the chapter and talks about praying three times for a physical healing and not getting it. Please notice, Paul does not wonder why God allowed it. He doesn't wonder what he did wrong. He doesn't blame others for not praying hard enough. He accepts it as part of a believer's life. In fact, he seems to wear these things as a badge of honor, doesn't he? We know he prayed for healing and protection and saw incredible miracles. This is the man that they took his apron in places and cut it into little pieces and took it out to people who were ill, laid this little chunk of cloth on them, and they were healed instantly. That's him. 
And then when he asks, I think, I'm, I'm rather certain for his eyes to be healed. I mean, the guy's writing half the New Testament. God, I need my eyes. Duh. <laughs> and God says, no. My grace is sufficient for you. Do you see the mystery that Paul's living in? Times in which there's so much power that people are being healed when just pieces of his apron are carried out and laid on them. And other times when he will go without himself. We all live with that mystery, people, don't we? Times you'll see incredible miracles and breakthroughs, and other times you, you will simply go through a tribulation, go through an affliction. Learn to dig down and hang on to God through long, difficult valleys. Don't you? Don't we? Yes? And there's no shame in it. Paul doesn't go through, why did God allow this? He doesn't, go, he doesn't blame himself. What did I do wrong? He doesn't blame others. He, he knows this. He knows that God's at peace with him. And God didn't send it. He knows that whatever he goes through, the Lord will be with him in the midst of it. Every step of the way. He knows that God will cause it to refine and grow his faith so that his faith will grow stronger, not weaker. He will not be destroyed by it. He'll actually be refined by it. He knows that. And he knows that as his faith grows stronger, his love and longing to see Jesus face to face will grow greater and greater inside him. In fact, in one place, he says, you know, I don't know if they're going to kill me or not. He says, quite honestly, I kind of hope they do um, because I'd really like to go and be with Jesus. But he says, I suppose you all need me too much and I'll have to stay here. Whichever. <laughs> I just paraphrased. Yeah, big time. You knew that. He knew, we, we know he prayed for healing and protection and saw incredible miracles, but suffering was still part of his life. And because he went through it with these truths in mind, they only made him stronger, just as they do for you and me. Let me ask you now, who again is in the middle of a trial? You're in the middle of a difficult time. Do you know some things about that trial right now? We don't need to figure out why it came from. We know the one place it didn't. And we know that he's with you. He didn't send it. And he will strengthen your faith and be with you and use it. You know that. Would you stand with me? Anyone right now who has fallen into that situation where you, you condemn yourself and you think, what did I do wrong? Why is God angry at me? Or maybe you, have, you, can, you answer that, oh, I know why this came. I know why this difficulty is here. I didn't do that. I don't do that enough. I, I don't pray enough. I did that. I, and this is God, God getting me for that. I had it coming. And so in your mind, God isn't your help, he's your problem. But right now as you listen to the word, you listen to St. Paul, who says he is at peace with you, you're willing to say, I, get, I don't understand then where this came from, but I do understand that God is at peace with me, he loves me, he's not punishing me, he is nothing to me but a loving father. So I don't know where it came from, but he didn't send it. And I'm willing to stand in that and trust that. 
I know that he'll be with me in it every step of the way. He will comfort me and help me and never leave me. I know that. Who needs to write in the face of your, of your, of your trial, your affliction, your tribulation, as he calls it? Right now, you need to say, God, you didn't send it, but you're with me in the middle of it. Would you raise your hand if you just need to make that declaration right now? Father, see us. See our hands. Lord, where, the, where, where doubts and fears and accusations have come, where we're, where we're punishing ourselves and looking for who to blame, when we're feeling that these things are a sign of somehow our failure, oh, God, break that lie off my brother, my sister right now. Break it off of us. We let it go. Now, right now, if you, whoever's raised your hand, tell him, I let it go. That's a lie. I'm not going there. I live in a mystery. Say that. I don't understand a lot of things. And I never am going to. But I do understand this. I trust you. You love me. You are at peace with me. And you are with me right now in the middle of this. You will never leave me for all eternity. I believe that with all my heart. Make my faith strong. Refine it in a crucible until it grows stronger and stronger. And my longing for you grows deeper and deeper. I love you, Jesus. I love you, my Father. And you love me with an everlasting love. In Jesus' precious name, I confess these things. Amen. I'm going to pray for you just one second. I feel like that. Father, for every brother, for every sister right now, in the middle of a trial, whether it be a physical trial with illness, whether it be a relational thing, whether it be finances, work, whether it's depression, whether it's a sense of discouragement or confusion, lack of direction, whether it's whatever, persecution, criticism, scrutiny from family members or people at work, friends, because of our faith. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for just breaking into this beloved's heart right now with the truth of the Word of God. May the word of God, like a two-edged sword, just cut into our heart. Open it up. And where there's fears, where there's doubts, where there's confusion, where there's accusation, just wash that junk out of there. We give you our heart tonight. And Lord, what a sweet thing it is to know that you're not our problem. You're our source. That you didn't send this. You're our comfort and our healer. You're our strength and our provider. We can run to you in the middle of our need. And then, Lord God, for your support and strength of your spirit, moment by moment and day by day, while we walk through it. And, Lord, however it turns out, we're headed for glory, eternal glory. And we thank you beyond words for that. In Jesus' powerful name. If that's your prayer, would you say amen? amen? Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. God bless you all. Have a wonderful week. He is at peace with you.